Hi, Professor Groundland here. Let's talk a little bit about epicurves. For more than a year and a half now, the news has just been full of images of epicurves. And I think most people get the general idea that these graphs are a visual representation of the spread of COVID-19 within a population. They make it easy for anyone to see the magnitude of the problem. When looking at these curves for COVID-19 in your county, you probably felt concern when the curve was going up and then hope when the curve was going down. Let's take a closer look at epicurves and what kind of other information can be gleaned from them. Epicurves plot the number of cases of a particular disease on the y-axis and the date of the onset of the illness on the x-axis. They are used all the time in disease tracking. An example of their usefulness includes determining how a disease is being spread within a population. Suppose that doctors and hospitals in an area suddenly start reporting a specific set of atypical symptoms, but they don't know what's causing it. If the cases are tracked, it can reveal how the disease is spreading. Here are some typical patterns. If there's a common source for the infection, for example, norovirus in a local swimming pool on one Saturday afternoon, there's going to be a sudden increase in cases and then a sharp decline. Or if that pool isn't sanitized pretty soon, it could become a continuing common source for infection, in which case there's going to be a fairly constant number until the source is taken care of. Diseases that are propagated, that is, spread from person to person, typically show a rise and fall in cases. Now you try it. What method of spread does this graph show for COVID-19 in the U.S. since February of 2020? If you said propagated, that's correct. Now let's suppose that you do know what the disease is and what the incubation period is, but you want to find the source. Can an epicurve help with that? You bet. Suppose that there's a sudden outbreak of E. coli poisoning and you want to find the source, so you plot the cases by date. Now consider that E. coli has an incubation period of 1 to 10 days with an average of 4 days. Here's how we can figure out when people got exposed. Find the peak and count back the average incubation days, that'd be 4 in this case. Then let's look for a range. Look at the first case. Suppose that they had the minimum incubation time, so in this case one day. So count back just one day for that first case. Then look at the last case and consider that maybe it took them the entire 10 days incubation period, so count back 10 days. We would come out with the most likely period of exposure on August 24th to August 26th. Now you can interview the people who are sick and ask them what they ate and where they ate between August 24th and 26th. Now you try it. Put your video on pause and figure out when the people on this graph were got exposed to cholera. Did you get March 6th to the 8th? If so, well done. The person who got it on the 15th is considered an outlier. They were probably not exposed when the rest of the people were, but rather exposed through one of the already sick people. Epicurves can provide other useful information too. For example, if a disease is endemic, that means that there's usually some number of cases within the population. If a graph shows that there's a steep increase above that expected endemic level, it would indicate that an outbreak is occurring. Or you may have seen these graphs used to describe why precautions are important during a pandemic to prevent overwhelming the healthcare system. For a while, the headlines were all about flattening the curve. Or you may now be seeing these graphs used to demonstrate that vaccination can help drastically reduce the likelihood that you're going to end up in the hospital if you do get COVID-19. 
If you're interested in learning more about EpiCurves, I suggest that you go to the CDC and use their Quick Learn Lessons for Epidemiology. Happy graphing!